Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Stephen van der Put will defend the academic thesis entitled Accountability for Human Rights Violations by UN Peacekeepers, a Legal and Theoretical Perspective. Dear candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the members of the committee, uh, friends, family, and colleagues for their presence and their interest in my research so far. Um, I'm going to start with the layman talk, as is tradition, and uh, this layman talk often is sketched out as giving an introduction to the research. But this specifically for me serves one purpose, and this is finally informing my mom what my research has actually been about. Because despite about 16 Samsung notes, she still blanks at the question what her son is actually spending all his time on and what he has done the past couple of years. So hopefully that will change after this short yet brief introduction. So what I want to discuss with you today is mainly uh, starting from the main research questions and then introducing the legal findings and some of the theoretical findings within my research. And hopefully that will give you a good indication of what I have been busy with so far. So first of all, I would start off with the main research question. And uh, what we see here is that the question is pretty much split in two parts in that sense. The first part is a focus on the legal elements which we see whenever we deal with accountability of human rights violations uh, by UN peacekeepers. And some elements here are worth highlighting in the question. First of all, the question specifically speaks about accountability for the United Nations as organization. So it's separate then from any accountability that might occur towards troop contributing countries in that sense. Secondly, it specifically speaks about human rights violations, excluding other areas of law which might be relevant, such as international humanitarian law or other violations which the UN might be possible to commit. Lastly, it is framed in the actual lex lata, or the law as it is currently, as it looks at the current possibilities and limitations in that sense. These legal findings are complemented by a more theoretical approach, and that is the second part of the main research question. And that, says, that focuses on more victimological elements and justice-based reasoning, in which it emphasizes how to provide redress for these victims, translating broader findings that, for example, have occurred whenever we've looked at violations committed by states to the practice of UN peacekeeping, and therefore potentially uh, proposing suggestions for approval or how this can be facilitated better and these uh, victims' rights can be taken more seriously. To briefly highlight why this is relevant, I've, uh, for a demonstration, highlighted two peace operations. And what we can see there is this is a UNTCO, which is pretty much the oldest peace operation that takes place. What we see here is that the operation, in a sense, is ge both geographically quite limited as in we speak about a few observation posts and a patrol base. And we see similar elements when we look at the mandate. The UN here acts as pretty much a limited actor with a very specific mandate that has a very limited task. Traditionally, this has meant that human rights obligations in these sense have been a little bit less relevant as these often speak about quite comprehensive obligations and the UN was pretty much often deemed unable to affect these in a meaningful way. What we have, however, seen is when whenever we look at a more recent operation, this is a map of the MINUSMA, we already see that its boat has expanded hugely in both the geographical scope, but also in the mandate. And what we see there is that the UN has started interfering with many elements which traditionally would be taken up by the host state government. In that sense, providing more potential for um, human rights violations in that sense, as these often speak about these obligations. Secondly, we've also seen that the UN has, in that sense, become a bit more aggressive with its mandate and, for example, also spoken about use of force, which, when used outside of the context of armed conflict, could potentially also amount to human rights violations. So that kind of highlights, in that sense, the relevance of this research. And then, for the first element, I've spoken mainly about the legal findings. 
Whenever we discuss about redress and accountability, what we first would like to establish is that we're actually dealing with internationally wrongful acts here. Within international law, it is necessary for two elements to be satisfied to speak about an internationally wrongful act and therefore also an obligation to redress. What we see here is that it, the act must be in violation of an international obligation and the act must be attributable to the party. So those form the first two elements uh, of my legal findings, the legal obligations of the UN and a possible attribution. Then as a second element, what we often have within international law is that there can be factors that are limiting towards, in this case, from the perspective, from my research, individuals, to actually gaining redress. Whenever we look at the situation in the UN here, we speak about them, for, for example, speak about the notion of immunity, which pr pretty much precludes claims within domestic courts, and the question if individuals would have a standing against the UN, or if they would be able to put forward claims, or if this would only be a right that is awarded to states, and only states are able to, um, to put forward such a claim. To briefly summarize the findings, and I'm trying to be brief here as well, um, so do forgive me if I'm not as detailed, but um, when we look at the legal obligations, I think a strong argument could be made that the UN is under an obligation to, uh, that it has, sorry, legal, uh, that it has human rights obligations. This can be based both on a customary law obligation, in which it states that the UN on those grounds would have an obligation to respect human rights, and secondly, on the, based within the UN Charter, which places the UN under an obligation to promote human rights, which in my opinion should also be read as the UN being obliged to respect human rights, as I think it goes directly against the purpose of promoting the, these human rights if we subsequently allow them to be violated as well. The second notion is that of attribution. And attribution within the UN context is often a tricky proposition. We are dealing with uh, individuals who are still acting in a somewhat official capacity of the state, who are pretty much then seconded to the United Nations. This, in a legal sense, can create confusion as to which party is actually responsible for the actions and violations that take place during these operations. Relying, on, however, upon the case law and statements made by the UN, I, I've argued within the thesis that in general we have seen that the UN has adopted these as agents of the organization and that on those grounds we would argue that unless um, national commands, for example, cut across command lines and make an, a conscious effort to affect uh, these decisions, that these acts could also be attributable to the UN. Obviously, with the obvious legal disclaimer that this is always a very situational dependent sit situation, which is a weird sentence to say. Having established that, we could argue pretty much that um, that we have a legal obligation of the UN there to therefore also be responsible for redress towards these individuals. However, when we deal with the specifics of the situation that we find the UN in, we have two specific challenges here. The first one is the immunity of the organizations. The UN is shielded by the Convention of Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations, which put forward a comprehensive immunity that enables the UN to pretty much be in a sense, and I'm paraphrasing here slightly, untouchable within domestic courts. As in, domestic judges have not, been able, have not been willing to consider cases brought by individuals against the UN on the grounds that it's put forward that the UN is immune in that sense. What we, however, find within the, uh, sec uh, within the convention is also uh, section 29, which puts forward pretty much that the UN would be responsible for establishing an alternative form of remedy. This, combined with the general accepted proposition within international law that immunity ought not to lead to impunity, I use as an argument, combined with, for example, the well-established human right to redress and right to a fair trial, to argue for an interpretation which argues that this convention, whereas it might shield the UN from domestic prosecution, does not shield the UN from being under an obligation to establish alternative forms of remedies here, which would be able to hear the claims of these individuals whose human rights are violated. That brings me to the last point, and that is the notion of individual claims. What we see here is that there's been a general difficulty of individuals to put claims forward towards the UN, also linked to the previously mentioned immunity. 
However, when we look at the limited situations in which the UN has actually recognized it has human rights obligations, we can see that there are some indications that they've also recognized claims of individuals in that sense. An example here, for example, are the human rights advisory panels within Kosovo. I use those as an argument to establish that the organization in general recognizes that it has an individual, that it has an obligation towards individual claims as well combined with the inherent nature of human rights. As probably the body of law which deals with individual rights and, and makes sure that individuals' rights are respected, it provides, in my um, view, a support, a, an important supporting argument to establish that the UN is indeed also under an obligation to hear these claims of individuals and take their redress in that sense seriously. Ultimately, combining all these conclusions, it leads me to a conclusion that, providing, of course, that the specific conditions are satisfied, the U UN can indeed be held responsible for the redress of human rights violations, and that this is an obligation that also subsequently would need to redress. When we, however, look at redress, we obviously face some specific challenges within the UN. First of all, we have the specific of, specifics sorry, of UN peace operations. They often operate in areas which are not really known for having well-established means of justice. And even if, they were, if that were the case, due to the immunity granted by, by the UN, they are often not applicable to them. That makes it difficult to argue that the UN a, can be satisfied with general considerations of justice. For example, whenever we look at general considerations of justice, what I entail is, for example, the classic statement by Aristotle, in which the judge acts as an equalizer, compensating victims for whatever the offender has taken away. Such a statement, however, works with a, pro, uh, with a, with a couple of uh, built-in conditions. It, it assumes that the judge is legitimate, it assumes that the judge has jurisdiction, and it assumes that the judge is able to, in a way, enforce these judgments. However, when we look at these notions, we can see that this is not the case with the UN. Proposed within this thesis, therefore, is the notion that the UN perhaps can draw lessons upon from the transitional justice field. The transitional justice field is a field of justice that is pretty much originated within practice. It has, pre it has uh, experience of uh, functioning within traditions in what, they often what has often been described as very imperfect situations. Situations in which there are not in established mechanisms, but situations in which justice always comes at a cost and different interests have to be weighed. My suggestion has been that uh, relying upon these notions of transitional justice, lessons within this can be drawn for the UN and that these can also be applied to the UN to take, this, uh, to take the uh, position of individual victims of human rights violations more seriously. Ultimately, that leads me to a proposal that proposes that the local claims board should be expanded with extra possibilities of awarding more than simple monetary compensation, that it also should have the possibility of, for example, establishing a truth and reconciliation commission in cases of which violations are deemed systematic or a failure of policy, and that a hybrid court should be established to guarantee that offenders are generally prosecuted. Ultimately, then, that is the conclusion of my thesis, that the UN is under an obligation to provide redress on the situations legally, and that there are theoretical models which would support this and perhaps can be helpful in considering how to take these positions of individual victims more seriously. I'd like to give the word back to the co-rector, and thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Wiedmar, Professor Wiedmer is Professor of Public International Law at our university, and he's also the chair of the Assessment Committee. Thank you very much, Prorector. Dear candidate, I would first like to congratulate you on your thesis. It addresses an important issue and brings together doctrinal, le doctrinal legal, and moral reasoning. But I must also say that I do not entirely concur with all your arguments and choices you made in this manuscript. Sometimes my impression was that you decided it was morally desirable to make the UN both responsible and accountable 
for all kinds of human rights violations and then try to look for, so, uh, so to say, every hook in the applicable legal framework on which you could hang your hat. While I can compliment you for sketching a very, read a very readable alternative position on certain fundamental doctrinal matters, I do not fully subscribe to some of your core premises, and this is where I would like to challenge you in the next few minutes. Now, you are talking about extraterritorial jurisdiction and jurisdictional clauses in human rights treaties, and you are talking about the effective control tests developed by the European Court of Human Rights under the European Convention. But I did not entirely understand how did you get there in terms of positive law. Namely, it is true that some, regionable, uh, that some regional human rights courts, and most notably the European Court of Human Rights, have established that UN Security Council's Chapter 7 resolutions cannot be interpreted as an authorization of human rights violations or need to be um, interpreted in, in, in line with human rights obligations of states. Um, but this was about implementation of the Security Council's resolutions by states that are simultaneously party to the European Convention and the UN Charter. This was not about implementation of human rights obligations by the UN itself, which is, of course, not a party to either treaty, neither the European Convention, not the UN Charter. So, my first sub-question here is, why is a case like al Jeddah even relevant for your argument? Again, you're looking at the UN itself, not for, impl not for implementation of certain resolutions adopted within UN framework um, by UN member states. Related to that, I saw that um, to a great extent you based your effective control doctrine in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. But again, we come to the problem that the UN clearly isn't a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. So why, and the convention cannot be said to be customary, which you could have defensible argument that, that which you actually make that the UN is bound by custom, um, to this effect, but the, the European Convention on Human Rights would not be generally customary. So again, why is this jurisprudence of the um, European Court of Human Rights um, relevant for your um, argument? And finally, on, on extraterritorial jurisdiction. I think it is one thing to say that the UN does have human rights obligations under custom, and that it is bound to promote it, promoting human rights by virtue of its charter. But I think it is quite another thing to bring to this scheme the concept of extraterritorial jurisdiction, which follows specifically from some human rights treaties, and not even from all of them. Say, ter extraterritoriality would work perhaps already quite differently if you were depending whether you were applying the ICCPR or ICESCR. But in any case, the UN is not a party to these treaties. So now my third and final sub-question here would be, how do you then take extrater extraterritoriality and extraterritorial obligations for human rights outside of, of the treaty law context and apply it to an international organization which is neither a party to these treaties, which uh, to which you are uh, referring, and, it, and does not even have a territory under international law. So basically, it cannot have territorial jurisdiction, so then it could hardly have extraterritorial. Thank you. Dear highly uh, esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, to um, briefly summarize as well for the people in the audience, whenever we speak about human rights obligations, there's often talk about jurisdiction, as in human rights assume a further uh, relationship between uh, the obligation held and the individual it's held against uh, and the party that has that obligation. So why speak about that in this context? I think, um, first of all, um, the difficulty is indeed that the UN doesn't 
have strict treaty obligations and any would be customary. However, whenever we do look a, at any form of human rights obligation, uh, jurisdiction there seems to be a consistent element. I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, Milanovic who stated it is pretty much the element of making the human rights relevant in that sense, differentiating it, for example, from broader concepts such as attribution and therefore also presupposing um, a stronger link required between the party that has that obligation and the individual the obligation is held towards. And I think that pretty much highlights in that sense also why jurisdiction in that sense would be relevant. Because if we would speak about the UN uh, having human rights obligations in this sense, but do not link it towards the concept of jurisdiction, we're either deal dealing with um, yeah, pretty much a f a almost a facade in that sense, as in we make either the human rights obligations of the UN meaningless, as in they never fall within the jurisdiction, uh, or our individuals never fall within the jurisdiction, or we may make them all comprehensive, and the UN would in that sense have pretty much worldwide uh, of human rights obligations. Uh, if I may interrupt you, but wouldn't that be attribution? So um, aren't you conflating then jurisdiction and attribution? Because well, I think that's um, in that sense always been a big debate in these sense. Um, but I think whenever we look at the case law of human rights courts, that there has been a differentiation between attribution and jurisdiction, and I might regret of opening the can of worms and referring to the ECHR again, but for example, when we look at Bankovic, I don't think anyone was arguing there that those acts weren't attributable to the state parties, yet the court ruled ultimately that they did not fall within the jurisdiction. And we have several of these examples where we can definitely speak of acts that are attributable to parties, but for some reason courts have decided that they're not fall within the jurisdiction. And I think that presents then an extra element which we need to talk about to make these human rights meaningful in that sense and give them then. Then why speak about the European Court of Human Rights? Um, I think I picked uh, the, uh, the, human court, the European Court of Human Rights in that sense has become quite leading in this topic and despite being occasionally not completely coherent, just due to the amount of case law that has uh, perceived from it. And I, I think when we look at Article uh, 38 as sources of international law, they do represent judgments that are valid in this context. And whereas they might have to be adapted here, I think speaking about uh, the extraterritorial obligations then in that sense, provide us with an indicator of what courts might consider relevant and how, for example, we could look at the UN satisfying the conditions there necessary to fulfill this jurisdiction and therefore making, the, um, yeah, making their human rights uh, obligations relevant and meaningful in that sense. So I think that was the approach I picked, um, and that is why. And we can also see that whenever we look, for example, at the actions of states, which have, in my opinion, generally regarded, for example, the European cor uh, cor court's uh, approach as legitimate, and therefore it's also maybe as a secondary effect started affecting practice slightly in that way. I hope that answers your question. If I, if I can have a quick follow-up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then you, you, you are applying the doctrine of the European Court of Human Rights and you quite rightly say that there has been a bit of a mess between jurisdiction and, and um, effective control or jurisdiction and, and attribution, which I, I, I completely agree with. But, then didn't, but that was in the European Convention context. But then when you pick these doctrines and apply them to the universal UN level, didn't you then import all these problems to, to another level and, uh, and maybe you should have left it uh, where, <laughs> where it is uh, within the convention? Um, I think that would have made my uh, dear, highly esteemed opponent, I, yeah, I think that would have made my life a lot easier in that sense. But um, why I, I've picked that indeed is also just because of the influence the court has had. And we see that in a way also with other, uh, not only the European court referring to these standards now, but they've become yeah, wider used within international law, I think. And there is for where I do think they're messy in a sense. I don't think we in that sense can avoid talking about them, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. 
The opposition will now be continued by Professor Gill. Professor Gill is Professor of Military Law at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and I would like to welcome him very much to Maastricht University today. He is joining us uh, online for this ceremony. And I'm very happy to give him the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a small correction. I am the Emeritus Professor of Military Law, the uh, present Professor of Military Law, President of the Um Dear candidate, it also behooves me to uh, congratulate you on a nice piece of work. I enjoyed reading it. I, I think one of the things I liked about your dissertation the best was its readability. Um, I think it's well structured on the whole, and uh, you're clear about where you stand and where your arguments go, and uh, your, your conclusions, whether or not I agree with all of them, uh, seem to flow reasonably from, from what you've stated. So it's a, it's a, a workmanlike piece of uh, research that you've conducted, and I, I, I definitely congratulate you on it. Like uh, your supervising or preceding uh, opponent, um, although I do uh, think you've written a very interesting piece of work, I don't necessarily agree with everything you said. Um, one of the points that I found rather interesting or uh, raised questions was the way you make use of trans transitional justice to, as you see, fill the gap. Um, well, perhaps I'm, I'm rather pedestrian, but to me, the answer um, to the problem of the gap in, uh, you might say, remedies was sort of left staring you in the face, but you didn't really give it a whole lot of attention. I'm referring to the model SOFA that you uh, adopted in 1990, which, according to the Louvre Manual on pages 120 and 121, is pretty much the customary basis for the immunity for the members, military members of the contingents and peace operations. Therefore, I refer to it throughout in that context. Whenever, wherever there isn't a SOFA, the Security Council almost invariably um, refers to the model SOFA as the interim agreement until such time as an agreement is reached. And most of those pretty much model the model the model of the US SOFA follow that model. Um, now in that model self, there are two paragraphs referring to remedies. One refers to a claims commission, independent claims commission, which will have jurisdiction over any uh, private law claim uh, of an official nature that wasn't uh, subject to multiple uh, or city state courts because of the nature of the claim not having any relationship to the U.S. official activities. And that would be a con a consisting of uh, three independent members, um, one independent member being appointed by the host state, one by the sending state, and the third member being appointed by the president of the International Court of Justice. And every other uh, dispute that was supposed to arise, for instance, those relating to the U.S. activities itself, whether or not it actually was involved with violating a human rights obligation, uh, whether that be in the customary law or otherwise, was supposed to be subject to an independent arbitration commission, also consisting of three members, with the initial third member being uh, appointed by the president of the ICJ as well. Now, as we all know, those provisions have never been enacted. You say as much a couple of times, uncle son, in your uh, speech. But then you move on and come up with completely different new remedies, hybrid courts and, and other things, and after a whole theoretical discussion on transitional justice. And I wonder, what's wrong with the remedies that are just waiting to be enacted? Why aren't they sufficient, in your view, to fill the gap in accountability that there undoubtedly is? I agree with you that there are clear situations where the UN cannot be effectively held to account for some of its actions, um, whether or not those are actually human rights violations or, or violations of another nature, is secondary to the point you make that this should always be a, an effective remedy, which I completely agree with you. That's your, your core conclusion. So on that point, we agree completely. But I would like you to address the role, as you see it, or don't see it, of the model of human software, 
And when we think it's utility might be in remedying the problem that you have so effectively raised in your dissertation. Thank you. Uh, dear, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, it's true, indeed, the model SOFA does propose some remedies, uh, potential avenues for remedies. What I think in that sense is, however, wrong with these remedies is that they fail to incorporate how our thinking about redress has been advanced and has been developed in that sense. For example, whenever we look at the Claims Commission and the private law claims and the execution regarding this, they, for example, emphasize that they only re uh, for pretty much compensate for monetary damages, which in that sense provides a very limited avenue through which individuals can, for example, claim, uh, give an example, burial costs against the union. United Nations. But our um, thinking about remedies in that sense has been expanded. So what we now also say is that remedies serve an important function in recognizing that the individual was a rights holder and that a party has indeed violated those rights. I think in that sense it is also important to consider that, uh, for example, it might be uh, unsatisfactory from a victim's perspective to have something which generally gets labeled as a human rights violation ultimately there be labeled as a private law claim just so they would be able to present a case to the claims commission and i think there is value um, within uh, recognizing that these are indeed fundamental occasionally human rights that individuals would hold and that they would have uh, then to be redressed um, Building upon that, I then also think it's quite unsatisfactory to deal also with only these notions from a perspective of monetary compensation. For example, what we see is that there's been a wide push towards also uh, seeing reparations as broader than only elements of compensation. Examples of this include guarantees of non-repetition, measures of satisfaction, or compensation that's not strictly monetary, but for example, can also compensate for opportunities lost or the possibility to establish further education or rehabilitation. And I think, and that's also what I uh, aim to propose then within the seventh chapter, that it's a missed opportunity and an opportunity that's perhaps more morally validated more by looking at, for example, how reparations have been employed and used within transitional justice, that the UN has not considered these notions. And that's also so why um, I still base my proposal of expanding, of keeping the Claims Commission, but therefore expanding it with some of the elements which we see within transitional justice, to bring this more up to date with how our thinking towards uh, the position of victims has been developed throughout the practice and the unfortunate practical experience we've had in these many cases, in which I think transitional justice has quite often been a leading element in that sense. I hope that answers your question? Well, not quite completely. If I have some remaining time from the chair, a quick follow-up. You do. Please. Um, okay. Uh, well, I mean, I completely agree with you that, that there might be broader remedies than just strictly monetary compensation. But again, I point out to you that the model SOFA makes a, um, a dual approach. It says private law claims of an official nature will be adjudicated according to private law standards, and any other claim will go to arbitration. There's nothing there that would bar the use of uh, other uh, forms of reparation, like satisfaction, like guarantees of non repetition, and so forth. Moreover, the difference between the claims commissions that they now function and the one that is envisaged in the uh, model here and so forth is that the Money and so forth is much more independent. As we point out in the uh, in your dissertation, there the present claims commissions are basically UN uh, organs. Um, so the UN is basically judging itself, but the money and so forth looks at this a little bit differently and um, gives both, both a seat to the uh, host state as well as making the deciding vote uh, a neutral third party arbiter. So I would say that there are significant differences which you meet most, if not all, of the, the points that you raised in your answer just now. First of all, because uh, arbitration would take the place of, of uh, anything that wasn't private law in nature, and that would include genuine human rights violations. Now, sometimes it's, it's sort of a borderline case. You mentioned the Haitian cholera uh, epidemic. Now, that 
case was thrown out by an it was not, not received by an American federal court due to their jurisdictional problems. But if that was done to arbitration, um, or the claims commission, it could have been found to both in my, in my view. It obviously was a tort in the sense that the Nepalese uh, peacekeepers practiced insufficient hygiene causing a cholera epidemic and caused a huge amount of uh, damage. I'm not sure how you could frame that in terms of human rights violation on the part of the United Nations organization vis-a-vis -vis the inhabitants of Haiti, but since the, uh, you, you could argue that there's a general duty of care driven harm to the, to the citizens of the country you're purporting to protect, I suppose you could maybe raise a claim in that sense, general sense. Either way, I think you would have had a remedy that would have been uh, effective in addressing the, the, the huge problems that that power epidemic raised, and which were not solved by this simple apology, which is a form of satisfaction, which was given by the U.S. Secretary General in lieu of providing any form of monetary compensation. So I would be interested to see how you, um, you know, respond to those points. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the follow-up, and you were indeed correct. I uh, did not sp speak about the independent arbitration option. Um, what I think is the difficulty within the um, independent arbitration option is that it, uh, for example, struggles with the notion of power. Why um, with, with the notion of power? is because whenever we see that the opportunity of arbitration is there, but where, for example, the UN for refuses to engage in this arbitration, individuals are pretty much left without any other meaningful options. As in, if the UN simply refuses to engage in this arbitration, we, can, uh, we see that they're pretty much left powerless. And we see that, for example, indeed, with the Haiti, with the Haiti example, where, leaving aside if that's a human rights matter or even then a civil law tort claim, as, as you stated, it might be a borderline case, the UN has consistently actually refused to engage in these. Now, theoretically, this would open up some options, indeed. Haiti could, for example, appeal to the UN to uh, fulfill its obligations under the model SOFA. It could ask for an advisory opinion of the ICJ. Um, and it has, so it has several options. But what we see consistently is that states have not done that, and individuals are left without any possibilities of doing so. And I think this highlights that that structure currently fails to account that arbitration might be a good option between, for example, private individuals when they both work on an equal basis and if one of them refuses to agree, the option of going to court is there as a, so to say, stick behind the door. But that in these cases, because of the UN inherent power relationship towards both the states and individuals that that are fall um, under these peace operations, that it might ultimately be ineffective in the sense that it can't really accomplish the goals and force the UN to provide redress here. So I think that would be my notion of uh, why I uh, think the in, uh, independent arbitration. I do completely agree with you about the statement about the independence of the commission and that that's currently a, a crucial element that we currently see lacking in practice in that sense, with the UN indeed pretty much being the judge of its own claims and putting forward uh, yeah, whatever it agrees with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Hoffel, who is Associate Professor in Public International Law at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I would also like to welcome her very much to Maastricht University today. Very good to have you, and you are also joining us online. Thank you very much, dear candidate. I'd like to thank you as well for the opportunity to read your work and to engage with your work and now to debate your work. And I, I enjoy the fact that we are engaging in that spirit of debate. And I like your strength uh, of responding to our questions so far. I want to touch on what I see as an element in the link of your reasoning that to my mind hasn't yet been fully justified. So you speak of course about how the UN is subject to human rights obligations. You then jump to the idea that the UN has a responsibility to redress these violations and to provide access to a remedy. This is at the heart of your thesis. So my first question, and what I'm afraid is going to be a multi-part question, is where we get that responsibility from. 
And I'm wondering actually if we need to circle back to human rights in your view to find that responsibility. Is it the right to provide the right of access to a remedy that we need perhaps to identify the UN holds? And I hope you don't mind if I too speak to your mother. I find it helpful to bring your mum in too because it's a helpful way for us as lawyers to get too tangled up in our own legalities. So, mother of our esteemed candidate. Let me go back to um, Professor Zidmar's discussion of extraterritorial jurisdiction already we hit uh, a bit of legalities. And let's remind us of what that's about. So, the reason why your thesis is so important, is so interesting, is so groundbreaking, is because human rights typically were developed to apply as between a state and its citizens. What the esteemed candidate is doing is seeking to make an international organisation responsible to individuals for human rights violations. So typically, a state need only provide human rights to those within its jurisdiction. And that's why we call it extraterritorial jurisdiction, when we say that a state has to apply its ob these obligations to individuals outside their territory. The problem, mother of the esteemed candidate, is that the UN does not have territory. The UN is not a state. So our problem as lawyers is how do we render the UN responsible and to whom? So it's that question of accountability to whom. And this is where we deploy the safeguards, the prudence I shared, Professor Zimmer's question, but let's assume that actually this is an influential source of jurisprudence that we might apply in this setting. Because the European Court said that human rights apply to those with the effective control of the state or the effective control of the entity. And so my problem for us is, if, and I'll remind you, it was a long time ago, that was the first part of my question, being where we find that obligation to provide redress. If it is indeed from a human right to provide access to a remedy, do we not need to establish then that the UN has the capacity to provide that right? So in the European Court uh, jurisprudence, we have to prove that the UN not only has effective control of territory, but that it exercises public powers within that territory. Does that not severely narrow that obligation to provide access to a remedy to those circumstances? And are we not in danger that in circumstances where we can't prove the UN is in effective control of territory, it lets us up to public powers, that maybe we have to divide and pay us in the rights, and what might drop out is the obligation to provide access to a remedy. I hope that everybody in the room, including your mum, um, and, and especially, of course, to you, uh, dear candidate. Uh, so I look forward to your response. Um, dear, uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you and also thank you for incorporating my mother. Um, so um, to deal with the first element where we get that responsibility, um, I think that is not limited to right of an access to remedy. But I think also when we look at the broader statement, the famous Chorso factory statement, that any international violation also comes in that sense with an obligation to provide redress. So that is more of an obligation within general public international law. Uh, I am very interested in the statement you made about extraterritorial jurisdiction. I must also readily admit that it was something I struggled with within the thesis as to how to make it meaningful then and how to divide within some obligations that the UN might hold towards individuals or might fall within this jurisdiction and what about some that don't. Whenever we look at the practice, I think uh, an important factor here is going to be, in that sense, for example, the mandate. Um, referring back to my presentation, if you, for example, look at UNTCO and compare that to MINUSMA, 
I think legally you would have to argue that both would have completely human rights uh, jurisdictions inspired by their mandates and how they're actually affecting, meaningfully affecting the lives of individuals that fall within that. However, I'm afraid that I don't really have a that specific answer towards what would fall within the jurisdiction here, outside of, for example, obvious examples that if the U UN starts detaining people, it would have a human rights obligation to make sure that that detainment has a basis, et cetera, et cetera and is not arbitrary, or that when it starts, for example, engaging in police operations and starts using force in that sense, that it has to respect the right of life of those individuals. But I do, I think, agree with you that, I don't know if that meant agreeing or uh, if that wasn't what, you, uh, and if it's not agreeing, then I don't agree with you. Um, but um, that it's uh, meaningful here what the jurisdiction entails, and that we don't have, in that sense, the full package applying, but that it would be inspired by the mandate and what the actual operation is and how that would take place. Whenever we, however, look at access to a remedy, I think that is a tricky one in that sense, because I think when you speak about having effective control over that, effectively the UN would always have that, because it would always, in my eyes, have the power to establish a means of effective remedy. So I think it would be difficult to argue that such a right would fall outside of the jurisdictional scope of the organization, as it is very much within their, um, within their power to affect this meaningful and towards the individuals. Um, I can refer back, for example, to the model SOFA mentioned by Professor Gill. The UN is engaged in these documents and conducts them with states, so and therefore would, in my eyes, also always have a meaningful influence over this right to redress and establishing those possibilities for it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, just a brief one, though, that I think human rights might become a bit of a red herring in some circumstances. But then I do see example of sexual exploitation by peacekeepers where it would be difficult, you may agree with me, to find the idea that the UN has violated human rights in that circumstance. The violation entailed is if the UN fails to provide access to a remedy, you might argue. But then your argument is you use the effective control framework. If you're saying, no, 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 that doesn't apply to the the first, then human you know, rights drops out of the equation. So, so this is my issue about entirely using human rights as your basis. Uh, Professor Gill has raised the idea that perhaps a different framework uh, is more appropriate, and, and in that respect, I might agree. But I think that in that respect, I might see a bit of clearer uh, articulation of your reasoning there, and you have provided uh, that in your answer. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Aro Semena, who is assistant professor in the Department of International and European Law uh, of our university, and who is also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you. Dear candidate, uh, thank you for your thesis. I believe it's a very thorough work and a great example of classical legal research tackling a very life problem. However, I want to raise questions regarding the theoretical dimension of your research. Uh, your research uses the transitional justice framework to address the crimes uh, committed by UN peacekeepers. This framework is designed to be applied to polities that are coming to terms with mass atrocity. This is severe, widespread uh, criminality that disrupts or even inverts the normal functioning of government. Uh, the, the crimes committed by the peacekeepers, however, these take place when the context of mass atrocity has waned, by and large. Uh, in most cases, the UN peacekeepers are not co authors collaborating or enabling parties to mass atrocity. However severe the crimes may be, these seem to be cases of common criminality and in some scenarios perhaps actually just torts. Uh, then my question is, uh, how can we justify applying the transitional justice framework absent this, what I would call the proper transitional context, which is this coming out of mass atrocity and that it applies specifically to the mass atrocities? Uh, is a power vacuum enough to justify applying a transitional justice frame, pardon, a transitional justice framework? If so, 
is there not a risk of making the transitional justice framework over-inclusive so that it would apply, let's say, to any crime that is committed in some sort of power vacuum? And uh, yes, that is my question. Dear highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think this is uh, something that has indeed proven difficult. When we look at practice, indeed, transitional justice is often focused on the cl what I call in the book like the classic triangle, the state, the former government, and the population between it and any atrocities that might have been committed there. What I, however, tried to highlight throughout, especially chapters six and seven in that sense, is that I think what more important is the ma than the actual fact that mass atrocities have been committed is what, the trend, is what those mass atrocities have meant for the legal system in that sense. Um, it is, has uh, quickly become one of my favorite quotes, uh, but it's by the work of uh, Ganesh, who, for example, talks about how uh, Rippenstein uh, validates that uh, that means that legitimate institutions are missing, and that makes it uh, difficult in that sense to speak about justice, as in war is not just a fog of rights, but is a tear across rights, and it makes sure that those rights do not apply in this sense. And I think that, uh, with, together with the very imperfect uh, situation Situation that these situations create really touch upon the core of what transitional justice means for me in that sense. It is therefore, in my eyes, less relevant what causes the breaking down of the justice system, but more that it sees that there are situations in which the traditional justice system, as we assumed it to work, does not work and where there might be practical solutions needed that are able to accommodate the new situation in which we cannot n rely upon the normal court, for example, due to the mass number of perpetrators, due to lack of domestic le legislation, due to the perpetrators being per protective by issues so such as immunity, towards political pressure to not engage in prosecutions. And I think these are all factors that can lead to transitional justice being more relevant in the sense than uh, how we've traditionally thought about justice in which we've seen established mechanisms that are just able to deal with violations and are therefore able to provide justice in a sense that does not really need anything to be established. May I follow up yeah. with, with, with uh, a, let's say, sub-question or, or elaboration? Uh, perhaps taking it a little bit to an edge case or a little bit to an extreme case. If you are in my country and you go from the coast over the Andes to the rainforest area, let's say, a, towns deep in the rainforest area, although they are under the law of the state, there is not re really an effective government. It's more or less a Lockean state of nature or a Hobbesian one, depending on how you want to see it. Uh, would you be tempted to apply a transitional justice framework to ordinary criminality taking place, let's say, in the Orient of uh, Ecuador or a similar country? Uh, thank you very much for the follow-up as well. Um, I think that depends on what you, in that sense, want to accomplish in that situation. I think if you look at towards establishing, indeed, what the name refers again, a transition towards, in that sense, a situation in which, for example, the state of nature is no longer the given, but we speak about um, something that is governed by law in that sense, I think transitional justice in that sense could have a value um, in that sense. But I think we need to be wary of the goals and things we, in that sense, try to accomplish here with accountability. What I think contributes to my reliance upon uh, transitional justice uh, here in this sense is also the role we've now traditionally seen it been ascribed within concepts such as peace building. And I think in that sense, there's also, for example, a perhaps almost operational overlap, and I speak about the book, uh, in the book about that briefly, about, for example, establishing trust and perceiving of, perceiving of legitimacy there, in which I think those goals um, have very much been ingrained within the transitional framework. And in that sense, also a strong operational link can be found within the UN peace operations and the potential application of transitional justice. So I would say it's a possibility. I don't think it's likely because I think we also need to look at what we want to est uh, establish there with the goals and how we want to move forward in that sense. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, esteemed candidate. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Leinsaert. Professor Leinsaert is Professor of the Practice of International Law at our university. 
Um, she is not able to be here for this defense, and her question will be read by the chair of the assessment committee, and that's Professor Wiedmar. Um, thank you very much, Director. Um, Professor Leinzad says, um, Mr. Candidate, first of all, I want to congratulate you on this book. It is a good and well-researched thesis about a problem of accountability that has been much discussed in the past 20 years or so. Your work takes a critical approach to the problem of accountability by the United Nations for human rights violations by its peacekeepers. This is an important subject as the lack of accountability will be seen as delegitimizing the, the role of peacekeepers in conflict situations. Your view is perhaps sometimes an unusual one, but it is an important manuscript that adds another voice to the literature on this subject. The research is well-structured, and I do like the approach in which each chapter does not merely end with a conclusion, but prior to that with a little section entitled The Way Ahead. I must apologize for being absent here today, particularly so as I would have liked to participate in this discussion. Now, in my past experience, I have had a number of discussions with the UN about where accountability lies between the UN, which has the authority over UN peacekeepers, and the state that has contributed troops to a particular UN mission in case human rights have been violated. These discussions focused on who has responsibility for the actions of UN peacekeepers, which consist of contingents of military supplied by UN member states. Formally, this transfer of military contingents takes place in the shape of a document called Transfer of Authority, DOA, through which a state supplies a certain number of its military personnel for a certain period of time to the United Nations at its request. During that period, the UN will have control over this national contingent and the sending state will have very little authority over the contingent as that authority has been transferred to the UN. These discussions focused on whether the transfer of authority by the state to the United Nations also implies transfer of potential responsibility for the actions of such troops. It seems logical that the transfer of authority also implies transfer of potential responsibility pro, um, provided issues of attrib attribution, accountability, and liability have been addressed. In the discussions we have conducted with the UN, we pointed out that although the United Nations are entitled to immunity, there is no obligation to necessarily rely on immunity, as this is a discretionary step. It might be a generous step to um, accept responsibility as a gesture and to save a reputation. Acknowledging that, uh, that things have gone wrong under one's authority may be a mature approach to failures during UN work. On the side of the UN, two arguments were used why, this, um, why not to do this. First of all, a general fear of the aggressive stance of American courts with limited respects for the immunity of the UN, who obviously have their headquarters in New York. Also, there was concern as to where the money for potential reparations could come from. We have no budget for this. You will understand that these discussions at the UN did not bring much, but I do have two questions for you in respect of this matter. I'm some, somewhat concerned by the opening sentence of chapter three, paragraph one, on page 48 of your book. In practice, neither the troop contributing country nor the UN fully controls the personnel deployed in UN peace operations. Out of context, that is a worrying statement. Some matters seem to fall through the cracks. Do you suggest that, that a gap in responsibility between the state and the UN, is that logically possible? And if so, uh, would that not open the doors to a major role for domestic or international judges? Or is it a slip of the pen related to the two forces that are a compromise between the desire for unity 
or command and legitimate interests of the participating states? And secondly, would you consider that the transfer of authority document could be improved in such a manner that issues of potential responsibility could be dealt with before the transfer of troops to the United Nations takes place? Uh, dear, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions. Um, to start off with the first one, I must say that was, might have been a slight slip of the pen, as in the statement requires a bit more nuance. What I meant there is not to say that neither party controls fully. What I meant there to say was that, for example, there are inherent caveats or, for, or procedures that limit the control that either party has over these contingents. So, for example, whereas we might say that general operational controls in these situations lies with the UN, that does not mean that that operational control is absolute. Most nations would still have national caveats and therefore also uh, procedures such as, for example, the red card holder, which might limit the ultimate control over such a contingent. And that's mainly, uh, in that sense, a legal matter uh, for us, and that makes it legally confusing in that sense. I don't believe that, for example, the individual uh, soldiers or participants on the ground have any questions with regarding their operational chain of command. But when we speak about those legal elements, it might make it difficult to then ultimately decide who was ultimately responsible. A prime example, for example, would that be the court's consideration uh, in the Netherlands when we look at the Srebrenica cases, where the court differentiated between two, uh, two periods in time and judged on those periods whether either the UN or the Netherlands was responsible. Then... You may briefly conclude your reply. Then whenever we look at the transfer of, of authority document, I think that in that sense could be helpful if that proclaimed broader instructions who was responsible. Technically, I think practice now states that the UN in general should theoretically accept responsibility and then later claim this back on states. In practice, however, we've seen that that quite often is lacking and hasn't actually taken place. But I do think actual implementation of such measures would help for the future. Steven van der Put, the time for defending your thesis has passed. The decree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request that you and your company, both here and online, await the results of our deliberations and our return here in this room.
Ja, al uit. Als ze binnenkomen. Dan. Steven van de Put. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Letchert is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I now invite your supervisor to take the floor. Please all rise. First, beloofed u that you always, volgens the beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit, te werk zult gaan. Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Ja, dat beloof ik. Krachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hierbij u, Steven van der Put, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens de wet en de gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris en de overige leden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het groot zegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Dat is een heel uh, boekwerk. Ja, beste mensen, dan is het allereerst uh, aan mij de eer om een kort woordje tot Steven te mogen richten. Dat zullen daarna ook de andere leden van de Supervisory Committee doen. Ik zal het in het Nederlands doen en jullie zullen het in het Engels doen. You will do it in English. I think, I think. Ja, mensen, even terug in de tijd. Want ergens midden 2016, als ik mijn e-mailarchief goed erop na heb geslagen werd ik gemaild door ene Steven van de Put, die ik niet kende, of ik hem wilde begeleiden, want hij had het een en ander gelezen over mijn werk rondom herstelmaatregelen, en met name in conflictgebieden. Het probleem was dat ik net rector was geworden aan deze universiteit, en ik had heel duidelijk voor mezelf bedacht, ik ga geen nieuwe AIO's meer aannemen. Ik ga mijn AIO's die ik nog heb goed tot een einde brengen, maar geen nieuwe meer. Maar Steven zou Steven niet zijn als die <laughs> toch niet doorzette en mij overtuigde met een heel interessant thema en een nog meer overtuigende e-mail, waar ik toch over stag ging en in ieder geval een eerste gesprek uh, ging plannen. En de rest geschiedde. Nou, niet helemaal zoals misschien bij een normaal PhD-traject, want Steven die combineerde zijn proefschrift in de eerste fase met zijn baan als militair. En kwam soms ook in uniform op bezoek bij mij, was ik ook nog niet zo gewend. In ieder geval niet in zo'n uniform. En ik combineerde mijn rol als begeleider met mijn rol als rector. En liep dus de hele tijd met die, nou niet de hele tijd, maar ook af en toe met die keten om. Dus het was best even zoeken hè, voor ons allebei. Ik in een nieuwe baan, een nieuwe rol ook voor mij... Jij die vol met ideeën en, 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 en een heel moeilijk onderwerp je proefschrift wilde gaan doen met een fulltime baan ernaast. Nou, wij 
hadden ook echt wel ondersteuning nodig. En daar kom ik dadelijk op terug. Maar als eerste wil ik uh, vanuit ook de universiteit de gelegenheid hier gebruiken om de faculteit militaire wetenschappen, in het bijzonder de sectie militair recht, te bedanken dat zij dit traject hebben mogelijk gemaakt. En ook Steven de ruimte hebben gegeven om aan zijn proefschrift te werken. Bart van den Bos was daarin cruciaal in de beginfase hè, om voor de originele plaatsing te zorgen. En later nam professor Zwanenburg dat over en samen ook met Martin Fink. En ook dankzij hun ja, sta je uiteindelijk ook hier eh, vandaag. Maar dat was misschien de externe context van ons traject wat we samen begonnen. We hadden ook nog steeds te maken met mijn eh, iets wat eh, ja, gekke agenda. Eh, dus ik zeg op een gegeven moment tegen Steven, ik voel me toch niet helemaal comfortabel dat je niet wat meer dagelijkse begeleiding eh, kan hebben, wat ook voor een buitenpromovendus toch wel heel belangrijk kan zijn. En toen heb ik met Jan eigenlijk contact gezocht van, goh, ik zoek uh, iemand die uh, zin heeft om dit traject mede te gaan begeleiden. En daar kwam Wim, uh, die, de naam van Wim kwam, die ik ook nog niet kende. Uh, dus Wim en ik werden aan elkaar voorgesteld en ik stelde jou weer aan Wim voor. En zo werd dat eigenlijk ook een heel mooi team uh, vanuit Maastricht die jou heeft begeleid. En ook Wim, heel veel dank daarvoor, want daar heb ik absoluut ook heel veel aan gehad. And of course you, Luke, uh, you were already in touch with, um, with Stephen and you had a, had a connection together. And your work in the area of transitional justice and broader, also within the field of international law and international criminal law, was crucial to help us get to the stage where we are now. And I know from Stephen also that he would not have enjoyed the whole PhD tra trajectory as much if you were not there. So thank you also very much for, uh, for joining the team. I think in the end, we kind of became a dream team, if I may say that. But I leave that up to you to judge. Terug naar Steven. Nou, ik liet al eerder doorschemeren dat ik dus overtuigd was, toen Steven zich bij mij meldde, door het onderwerp, maar ook door zijn houding. Allereerst even kort iets over dat onderwerp. Steven wist dat ik me bezig hield met vraagstukken rondom het bieden van herstelmogelijkheden aan slachtoffers van internationale misdaden, zoals oorlogsmisdaden en genocide. En zowel het internationale recht als de victimologie kennen nog veel onopgeloste issues, die ook juist in de combinatie met deze twee disciplines verder wetenschappelijk onderzoek interessant maken, zowel theoretisch, juridisch als empirisch. En Steven kwam bij mij met het onderwerp heel specifiek gericht op mensen die slachtoffer zijn geworden door VN-handhavers van de vrede, oftewel de UN Peacekeepers. Hij wilde schrijven over de immuniteit die de VN gaf aan de plegers van misdaden of schendingen van mes mensenrechten. Hij wilde kijken of ontwikkelingen in andere rechtsgebieden konden helpen toch vormen van herstel te bieden aan de slachtoffers. En hij keek naar ontwikkelingen buiten het traditionele recht, zoals ook op het terrein van wat we transitional justice noemen. Het kostte jou en ons in het begin best wel wat tijd om de vraagschelling scherp te krijgen, niet te breed uit te wijden, de diepte te vinden in de analyse van alle leerstukken en rechtsgebieden. Maar je geloofde in je onderwerp en zette volhardend door. En vandaag sta je dan ook terecht hier. En net in de nabespreking ook rondom jouw verdediging en ook in de vragen die gesteld werden, kwam niet voor niks woorden zoals groundbreaking, views unusual, new ways of thinking, an original mind... Dat is wat jij uitstekend in jouw boek hebt weten te brengen. Dan toch ook over jouw houding wil ik wat zeggen. Dan wordt het meestal wat ongemakkelijk. Um, je moet weten, er zijn heel veel soorten PhD's. PhD's die hun afspraken zelden nakomen. Die zichtbaar lijden onder het hele traject. Combinaties daarvan weer. En je hebt PhD's zoals jij. En ik moet zeggen, die zijn wel een klein beetje in de minderheid. Want wat maakt Steven nu Steven, beste mensen? En de, de moeder, die wordt natuurlijk vaak genoemd vandaag, die zal misschien dit beamen. Maar in ieder geval naar ons toe is Steven iemand die altijd vriendelijk is. Altijd afspraken nakomend, tijdig updates sturend, altijd voorkomend en respectvol. Misschien dacht ik, is dit onderdeel van de militaire vorming en discipline. Die enorme toewijding naast een fulltime baan aan het begin van je traject, inclusief wonen op de kazerne en de militaire missies. Ik vroeg me echt wel eens af, hoe doe je dit toch allemaal? Altijd ook bereid om naar Maastricht te komen en altijd geduldig als ik toch net iets meer tijd nodig had om al die hoofdstukken weer opnieuw te lezen en te becommentariëren. En ik kwam vaak met alle handen commentaar in de kantlijn dat ik wel eens dacht, daar zit je natuurlijk helemaal niet op te wachten. 
Maar je nam het rustig op, was dankbaar voor de tijd die, er weer alle, die we er allemaal in stopten en ging aan de slag met de commentaren. En een proefschrift schrijven, beste mensen, is niet eenvoudig. Sommige mensen vinden het ook echt een uitputtingsslag. En ook daar kwam de militaire ervaring van Steven van Pas. Ik heb namelijk zelf niet gezien dat je eronder leed. Misschien je vriendin en je familie vast wel eens, maar wij zagen het niet. En jouw vriendelijke glimlach heeft in ieder geval naar mij toe jouw gezicht nooit verlaten. En toch zul jij ook opgelucht moeten zijn dat het vandaag voorbij is. Dat je jezelf vanaf vandaag dokter van de put mag noemen. Dat je kunt doorgaan op de weg die je bent ingeslagen. Een weg vol met idealen en ambities. En vooral van jouw idealen heb ik het meest genoten tijdens onze gesprekken. Vol overtuiging en passie kon je jouw verbazing uiten over de gebrekkige vormen van herstel voor burgers die slachtoffer worden tijdens vredesoperaties of de totale afwezigheid ervan. Hou die passie en die overtuiging. Het siert je als mens en het zal je als professional in de militaire omgeving of als academicus helpen bij te dragen aan een meer rechtvaardige wereld. Ik heb gezegd en ik geef nu heel graag het woord, first of all, to look your supervisor. Well. Uh, Stephen, just, just a few words um, about the experience of you coming to Belfast many, many years ago. Uh, it feels like only yesterday. And um, we're now at the end of this process. And it's very rare that you get a PhD student who you know, is so enthusiastic, you know, even during your master's, and is still enthusiastic <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so it's, it's a credit to you, it's a credit to your family about how hard you've worked. I have, I've never known a student who was so tenacious, even in your defense, so like strong um, and in your will, but to be able to take on a PhD, which is, is, is a full-time thing and it's a difficult thing um, to grapple with such big international law, but also transitional justice issues. You took it in your stride. I, I remember, and uh, Rihanna, as I said, you know about this, about you know, you, you, even when you were in the barracks, even when you were working um, in the army, you still took the time in your evenings and your weekends to work on this very difficult subject. And I'm incredibly proud because, you know, so many years in Belfast, you were this happy, enthusiastic student, um, and you've put all your will into being at this point. So, like, I'm, just, I'm so proud of you. So, really well done. It's credit to you and it's credit to your family. So, I'm so pleased for you today to enjoy this. Um, so, well done. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, these are going to be tough acts to follow, but um, I'll try. Stay on. Well, yeah, I also did a bit of uh, digging in my email, like Rihanna mentioned, because the email that uh, in which, uh, yeah, actually, John Smith first uh, asked me if I would be interested in maybe uh, acting as a co-supervisor to a uh, candidate by, uh, by Rihanna. Yeah, also kind of took me by surprise in late 2019, but then we met up and, uh, yeah, I immediately liked the topic and uh, it seemed that we also hit it off uh, well on a personal note. So, But from that moment onwards, um, I actually needed to think how long it had taken because to, um, for you to complete the PhD because it wasn't all that much time, at least from the moment that I got involved. And um, uh, Rihanna already mentioned your military discipline uh, and I do think it explains something about the fact that, uh, yeah, in my understanding, usually one role of the supervisor to an extent is to keep the candidate on their toes and to make sure that they fulfill their deadlines. But in our relationship, I usually had the feeling that it was the other way around. <laughs> because yeah, if I had not read a draft or if uh, I had a bit of a delay, you would always remind me uh, in a very polite but firm way also uh, that, that uh, yeah, it was time to get, to get some feedback. And yeah, that was actually a very pleasant way to do a supervision because at least I didn't need to worry whether I had forgotten an email or whether I had missed anything. So another thing that was very pleasant is actually, yeah, reading your drafts and also seeing your work develop because, uh, well, it was reflected also in your defense. It's interesting, uh, the interesting thing that I found about it was that, yeah, you come with an idea, you have a sense of what you want to say, you know how to put it in very stark or simple, uh, simple terms, and sometimes it might even seem simplistic, but it isn't. But um, basically, maybe a parallel could be with a sculpture that, uh, that would be made by, by Michelangelo, who believed that uh, the ideas were present in the marble, and all he needed to do was carve out the ideas from, from, uh, from, uh, from that were already present in there. It seems to be 
very much the way that your mind works. You just need to keep asking you questions, maybe throw things at you, also tell you, uh, does it really work that way? And you will develop your argument and you will come up with a way to, to basically make the point that you originally seem to be wanting to make. And sometimes it's a bit unorthodox or a little bit more difficult to, to initially accept, but I did find you quite persuasive uh, many, many times. In the meantime, you also managed to master quite a broad array of fields, not only public international law and also some areas of, of military law within that, but also, yeah, the theory of transitional justice, uh, any ideas that might basically help you to achieve your aim, you delve into them and it shows a, a big intellectual curiosity that, that, and that uh, is also going to serve you well, I think, in the future. Um, apart from that, what I was also impressed by was that you like taking other initiatives, not only within academia. You've already published a bit. You wrote some blog posts. You published a few articles. You've basically engaged in different fields, which also basically set you out for a good academic career. But also, apart from that, things like learning Chinese. I don't know if, if uh, I don't know if you used any of it on your recent travels to Taiwan. But um, but it also shows a curiosity to continue learning about the world. Uh, around you, and I'm really looking forward also to seeing uh, yeah, what that is going to bring to you in the future. So, yeah, I want to join yeah, the other supervisors in congratulating you, uh, and yeah, you have really done the work that you can be very proud of, and I'm very proud of you as well. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. van der Put, also on behalf of Maastricht University and its Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree that you just acquired. Um, as you know, it's the highest degree we have available as a university, so that's really, uh, that is really special. Um, congratulations also to your paranyms, uh, to your supervisors, um, and of course to all your family and friends, both present here in this room and watching this ceremony uh, online. Uh, do celebrate. Um, I, have, uh, <laughs> I have still one practical remark, which is that after uh, this ceremony there will be um, a reception where it will be possible for everyone present here to congratulate the young doctor, um, as we say. Um, and for the audience watching this ceremony online, I would suggest that you uh, propose a toast to the uh, young doctor at home or wherever uh, you are. Um, there is still one other practical remark to make. We have a great tradition here at this university, and that is that we take the traditional photo um, of the young doctor together with the paranyms, together with the supervisors, and together with the uh, full committee and with the uh, beadle. Uh, and we will do so right here um, in this aula, so that we have also, and I'm very happy about that, have also Professors uh, Gill and Hovel uh, present uh, uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that photo. And I would like to ask everyone who is present here in the room to already go to the uh, uh, reception, except for the people who are right now here on the first row, um, because they are allowed to take that photo. <laughs> and with that, I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>